have had three letters posted into the post box. Okay, three. These are the greatest minds in the south of England, and you can put three ideas. Slightly worried. Right, I'm going to pass some of these sheets around. Please take the opportunity just to put some ideas down to what you think the big challenges are with regards to the nexus, whatever that might be. Is yeah. that three or post Brexit? Yeah, well, let's, we'll come on to shocks. We'll come on to shocks to the nexus later. And people might have different ideas of what the nexus means, and that's absolutely fine. You can fill out a word here. <laughs> so you may not know, but the, the Nexus Science USRG was announced relatively late. So we've got a very limited period in which to spend the first year's budget, hence all this food. So please, grab cakes, grab coffee, have some extra, get by the waistline now, just grab everything. Okay, a huge welcome, a huge welcome to, well, our first Nexus USRG event. Um, great to have Tim Benton here that's going to give a presentation on Nexus issues. Just, for many of you might not be too familiar with the with the Nexus USRG because we just begun, then I'm going to give you a little bit of a background. My name is Paul Kemp, for those of you that don't know me, and this is Joel Smethurst. We are the co-chairs for this particular USRG. We have people here, obviously from Southampton, but also a big welcome to those of you that come from Nottingham University. We've got Imperial. Where are you all? <laughs> who's, not, who's not from Southampton? <laughs> Yeah, Nottingham. Big, big welcome to industry. The EPSLC are here, so we've got the research councils as well. So we've got some key people. So a big welcome to everybody, and um, hopefully you're going to find today useful and interesting. So the nexus. What is the nexus? Well, it's really difficult to find definitions, and there's lots of de different definitions. This is what I quickly wrote before this meeting. I think of the nexus in terms of management and development of resources and resource sectors. And it's this understanding that resources or the development of them don't happen in isolation. If we are to develop one resource, we're likely to have a negative or an effect at least on another particular resource. And Tim's going to talk more about this in, in detail. Often we think, or the, or, the, or the literature if you like, will refer to the WEF nexus, water, energy, food. Okay? It doesn't have to be that, that's just one nexus. Okay? People talk about extending that nexus, bringing an environment in. Other people will narrow that nexus and talk about energy and water. So there's likely to be a system of nexi, there's such things, with all these interacting factors interacting in an interdependent way. The problems that we face as a society are really they don't fall into the silos that we often work in, and that's one of the big challenges that we face is to do this interdisciplinary work. So these are the aims of the Nexus as I thought about them. Okay? The Nexus belongs to us all, or this USRG belongs to us all, so this isn't set in stone. This is what we're aiming to do, but you as the community can drive the direction of this particular USRG. So one of the key aims, I think, is to build an interdisciplinary relationships within um, the university. Okay, so we all work in our silos, we work in our various faculties, it's often difficult to interact. I know there's seminar series and so on um, attempting to get us to do that more, but of course the USRGs are all about trying to get this network, this, this cross-disciplinary work going on across the university. There's a lot of Nexus activities taking place outside of Southampton as well. There's a big ESRC funded network on the Nexus. A lot of activities, I know some people might have gone to some of those over the past few years. How do we feed into that bigger environment of, of Nexus activities? We're interested in the third point, 
Okay, what's it what's in it for us? What can we do? What can we get out of the Nexus? If we have these cross-cutting interactions between ourselves as researchers and the bigger community, will this lead to more research council bids? Perhaps we could develop a CDT on the Nexus in the future. Development of innate curiosity driven research and applied sciences, ref submissions, you know, what are the benefits to the university? What are the benefits to us as individuals? It's obviously something we need to be thinking about. Can we influence policy and practice and future research funding in this area? Another thing that we might be wanting to focus on as we move forward. And be part of the process of nurturing and developing research in this field as it develops. So here's just some of the aims that we could have for this USRG. Okay? Not set in stone, we might refine those aims, we might change those aims. We will develop a steering group that's going to help us refine these if we need to. How are we going to get there, Joel? Okay, so we've tried to kind of set a kind of a, a road map, really, for where we'd like the next science to go. Um, it's a little bit light on detail, as kind of Paul's already said. We're very much looking for the group to try and define exactly uh, where we go as a USRG. Um, but these are the kind of things that we're going to be trying to do over the coming years. And the first thing we probably need to try and do is create some kind of steering committee for the Nexus USRG. Um, and I think there are some, uh, I call them to chair, or there are some listed co-chairs, I think, in the proposal document. But I think we're also potentially looking to try and form a slightly larger committee that will help to actually kind of steer the direction of the overall Nexus. Uh, and I think we'll come back later on, actually, to sort of uh, trying to maybe define who some of those people are. Um, we're looking for people to identify uh, what we consider to be the key nexus challenge question. And so that's part of the event today, and the idea of having the, uh, the post box at the front. So what are the key nexus uh, science challenges that we want to try and address? I think we then want to think about our own capabilities. So uh, what, what are the challenges in relation to uh, the capabilities that we have at Southampton, so the people within the group which we have? Uh, and then we can move on to actually think about some of them, the key <laughs> questions or challenges that we as a group actually want to try and address. So what is the Southampton focus within the Nexus space? Um, we're then going to try and form, of course, some uh, kind of collaborative interdisciplinary uh, groups to try and actually take forward a number of things uh, in terms of actually thinking about, be it joint PhDs, uh, potentially things like CDT, so trying to take forward uh, particular ideas. Um, clearly, we want to try and develop collaborative linkages with other groups external to the university. <coughs> So there might be uh, areas that we feel that as a group we don't have expertise in, so we actually need to draw other people in to the group. And that might be other people from Southampton, and it might be other people uh, from elsewhere. Um, and think about how we actually interact more widely within the Nexus sphere. We probably want to actually try and have an influence on the overall uh, national Nexus debate, the international Nexus debate. <coughs> Uh, and then develop strategies to actually try and influence funding streams. That's very much about actually going to the research councils and actually saying, well, we think these are major areas uh, in which we think it's important to uh, develop and uh, could there be specific calls relating to particular sections and sectors and so on. So today's schedule then, what are we going to do today? Well, we've had lunch. As I said, we've got the post box there to try and capture ideas at the very early stages, because I think it's going to be interesting to see how these ideas evolve and change as time goes on. Now it's time to introduce Tim, from Tim Benton from the University of Leeds, who is going to talk more about Nexus issues, particularly with, an air, with, with a focus on food to some extent, 
Then afterwards, we're going to have a short break, and then we're going to have, we've got a professional facilitator in at the back of the room. We're going to split into groups, and we're going to try and explore a little bit further what we think the big challenges is, because today that's the aim, to try and begin focusing on what we think the big questions, the big challenges are, from our perspective, the Southampton perspective, in terms of the nexus. So, a big warm welcome to Tim, who is um, a professor in population ecology at the University of Leeds, and he's also the BBSRC UK champion for global food security. No, you're not? Okay. Who did this slide? It's the cross-government <laughs> <laughs> Okay, it's, it's, a cross, BBSRC. it's a cross-government champion. Um, actually, I've known Tim for a, long time. a lot of years, actually, because he, he used to lecture to me when I was doing my PhD up in Stirling, so we, we've got a certain history, and then we met again at a sandpit recently where we got some funding from EBSRC for one of the Nexus activities. And with that, without any further ado, I'll hand over to Tim. <coughs> Everybody, um, I'm going to talk. This is going to be a largely unformed stream of consciousness issue around uh, what, what Burke gently uh, calls the interconnectedness of all things, which to me is the Burke gently was one of Douglas Adams' fictional characters, fictional detective. Um, the interconnectedness of all things, which to me is an element of what we're trying to get at with this term, the nexus. and. I just wanted to start off with the real world importance of this. And I define Nexus as the interconnections between systems. Now, whether that's food, energy, water, land, climate, environment, or whatever, it's the connections between systems out there in the real world. And I just want to kind of posit this as a starting point that when you look at the Middle Eastern crisis, there is two situations where climate impacts led to food price spikes. The first one, 2007-8, led to the Arab Spring, and it was the cost of food that was going up very, very fast that got people out onto the street. And then we've had a long-term drought, had a long-term drought in Syria during the 2005-10 period, and part of the result of that is that people left the land, especially young men left the land because they couldn't have a future on the land, they didn't think they had a future on the land, moved into cities, unemployed, young, ideological, and therein lies some of the issues that plague us to today. So although this is a kind of nexus problem, what I want to do is just really emphasize that we're not talking about things that are academically important, we're talking about things which are fundamental to the way our societies work. I've done a lot of work recently on extreme weather and global food system resilience, prompted by some of this, and our systems are much more fragile than we think that they are <coughs> because of these sorts of things. And there was a nice report in The Guardian this morning from Tom Levitt, um, which is referencing a UN EP report that was published this week about how uh, rapid change in food prices will affect a whole lot of people around the world and lead to these sorts of things. So it's not an academic interest. And I think one of the things that we've got to kind of consider about driving the interest in this area is not just that we've got more people living on the planet, demanding more, etc., etc., but we've also living in a world that is becoming more changeable. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes thinking about climate change. Because um, I was talking to Paul Rounds a little while ago. We don't do a very good job of articulating what climate change will mean to us in society. So I just want to um, spend a minute or two on thinking about this. <coughs> this is a map of the world with a four degree temperature rise, which is about on course for where we're going at the moment. And when you talk to people about climate change, they say, oh, two degrees, being a bit warmer, I'm wearing shorts more often, and implicitly think that the world of two degrees warmer will be the same as the world today, which has been two degrees warmer. But I just want to kind of talk that through. So this is a map of temperatures 
on a global basis towards the end of the century, perhaps, if we don't do the Paris thing. Oceans are slightly cooler, land is slightly warmer. The color code shows up in the high Arctic, you've got plus nine, plus eight degrees, Midwest is plus seven degrees. So some parts of the world will go up remarkably. The UK is up there in a kind of light uh, yellow color, and we're expected to go up something like three to four degrees. That sounds um, about on par for a four degree world. But at the moment, our central England temperature, which is the longest running temperature time series in the world, is about 10 degrees. It's just, just, we've just passed 10 degrees as an average annual temperature. <laughs> if you add four degrees to the 10 degrees, you go from the greens to the light yellows, and the light yellows are southern France, southern Spain, North Africa. So the first thought that I want you to have is to think what the world would be like, what the UK would be like, if actually our climate was transposed to be something like Southern France. Lovely, you say. But then our buildings aren't designed. It's already quite sweaty in here. What would it be like if it was going to be transposed to Montpellier, say? <laughs> um, oak trees and all our kind of traditional plants wouldn't be existing. Our butterflies and birds wouldn't live in the same sorts of habitat. Our farming systems would be very different. So the first thing is that clearly the climate's going to change, and that is actually potentially quite a radical shift. The second thing is that we're already seeing, and um, I could go on a, 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 about this at length, but we're already seeing significant <coughs> changes in the weather, not the climate. So if you think about the climate as being the average weather, it's like having a normal distribution. The climate describes the mean, and the weather is the variation around the mean. And you can have a situation where the variation gets bigger, whereas the mean stays the same. So the two are not necessarily coupled, but as the mean gets bigger, then the variation stays the same. And actually, there's some evidence that the weather is becoming more variable, and extreme events are happening perhaps an order of magnitude faster than the climate models um, have hitherto suggested that they will do. And what that means is not just that we have more variable weather on a week-by-week -week basis, but we have the risk of more disruptive weather. And just as an example of that, this is from a, a report that we published last year. This is a coupled crop climate model for the Midwest up there. This is effectively the last 40 years, and this is the next 30 years. And I've just superimposed this tail of the distribution on the now. And what you can see is that the low tail of the distribution is a lot fatter. So effectively becoming a fat tail distribution. <laughs> And if you define a bad year as having seven tons or less, then the risk of having a bad year has gone up by uh, about two and a half times, just over the last decade or two. So that means that our supplies of food are going to become, become more variable, and therein lies the notion of, well, how do we make a, the system resilient? And the final thing I just want to flag in terms of thinking about climate change <coughs> is that underlying a lot of our climate, there are clearly large, time, large circulation patterns in the ocean or in the atmosphere. We don't really know what actually determines where they go, but there is already some degree of, um, um, of dynamical evidence that sometime over the next 100 years, we carry on as we are, the North Atlantic overturning circulation, the Gulf Stream, will slow down or stop. Now, if that the Gulf Stream slows down and stops, that will also affect uh, the atmospheric circulation. But if you just think about where we are, and then compare it to the other side of the pond, and think about the climate <coughs> there, I looked it up recently when I was, when I was giving a talk. A kind of an analogous place to some, somewhere like Cambridge, over on the other side, is in northern Quebec. And it's very difficult to find an inhabited town in northern Quebec, because they have six months of snow and it's, you know, minus 20 degrees maximum daytime temperature in the middle of the winter. So if the atmospheric, if the Gulf Stream turns off and there are associated uh, uh, changes in the large-scale circulation pattern, patterns in the atmosphere, we could be in a very different climatic situation in 20 years' time or 40 years' time or 60 years' time. And climate change will then be really, really instrumental in determining how all of our systems work. 
So we tend to think about climate change as being a kind of gradual, gradual changing. But actually we are seeing significant changes in the way that food is produced. We're not just thinking about, well, you know, crops will have to move northwards and all the rest of that. The actual ability to produce the amount of food that we want, we demand, and how we ship it around the world are very um, sensitive to these sorts of different points and changes and extremes. So I think all of this is going to help shape some of the issues to do with how do, we, how do our systems interact with climate and how do we make sure our systems continue to function when the climate as a driver is going to perhaps be much more variable. Now whether that's food systems with water inputs as well as the constraints over land and all the other things or whether that is energy systems or you know, the demand for energy going up as we have to turn air conditioners on all the time because we're getting hotter. You know, all of those things. So just think in terms of nexus, as us moving into a more variable world, a more resource constrained world because we want ever more, but it's also going to be more variable. And then <coughs> the, the chance, the risk of having a four degree world is quite frightening, I think, when I articulate it to myself. So then we have to think about not just adaptation, we also want to think about mitigation. So how do we avoid the four degree? And in December, we all signed up, all the world signed up to this notional well under two degrees Paris COP21 agreement. And I just want to indicate how challenging that is. If you look by services for what we want in the home, then out of all of the greenhouse gas emissions, 30% roughly comes from agriculture and food when you take into account the processing and cooling and all the, all the other sorts of stuff that's associated with it. That's about equivalent to lighting, domestic car and domestic air travel, washing machines, which are very labor and uh, energy intensive, and heating and cooling. So effectively, our demand for food is about the same as all of the other things that create greenhouse gases. And yet, the policy discourse is about how do we make light bulbs more efficient and cars more efficient, not how do we eat in a way that is consistent with Paris. And if you look at our, the carbon budget that we need, that we've got left to spend before we break the Paris Climate Agreement, food, just food, will eat through that carbon budget by about 2045. So that's nothing else. That's not energy, that's not lighting, that's not cooling. Food alone will get us through the Paris Climate Agreement. And so either we, by 2045, either we think about how do we change our diets and change our demand for food and shrink this, or we lock ourselves into three, four degrees of climate change. So I was, in, I was at a meeting in the House of Parliament yesterday and John Lockhead was there. Uh, chief scientist at death, and we had a quite a long and interesting conversation about these sorts of things. But it was a the meeting was primarily about waste, food waste. And I said, the food that we waste on an annual basis, on a global basis, is about a third of the greenhouse gases. So it's about a third of the volume of food, it's about a third of the greenhouse gases. And that's about four to five gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. The food waste alone will eat through the entire carbon budget from Paris within 50 yeah, years. The food waste will destroy the Paris agreement. So our food system and the embedded water and all of the other stuff is something that is unsustainable. However you define sustainability, it is unsustainable. So I think we have an issue of think when we think about nexus type stuff. It's not just thinking about the supply side but thinking about how do we manage the demand side because we can't carry on um, in the direction of travel that we're going. Um, so I just want to put a, a bit of flesh on the bones of food about why I think it's important from a nexus perspective. Now one of the issues I think of the academic discourse is that it's very easy for us to get excited by academic things and putting some of the issues around resource constraints into the framework of food and water, and perhaps energy, is useful to, when it comes to talking to the policy community or 
um, elements of industry or people in general, because it, everybody has a relationship to food. Many people have a relationship to water, but not in quite such a personal way. So I just want to emphasize a few things. This is a map of the world. Where it is colored is where it, land is used for food. Um, in yellow, this is pasture land, and in green, it's effectively arable land. You can see that the only bits that are grey are deserts, often cold, and areas which are primarily forested. So we have a finite amount of land. And we can't, no matter how much we demand, there isn't a lot of scope for increasing that. We also have a relatively finite amount of water, and it is amazing how much, how much water is required for the production of our food. So on a daily basis, now, on a total uh, water budget basis, agriculture uses about 70% of the world's extracted water. A kilo of beef will take about 11 tonnes of water to produce. That is, water to grow the grain or the grass, uh, water to process the meat, water to uh, allow the cows to drink, and so on. 11 tonnes, that sounds a lot. It doesn't matter if you're in the west of Ireland, but if you're in Texas or California, then it's clearly another matter because of their drought prone. Um, a single green bean that we might import from Kenya uh, takes about a gallon of water to produce by the time you've watered the plant and the plant has grown and all the rest of that. So if you buy a packet of beans, 40 or 50 beans, you put it in your fridge, you lose it, find it well, five days later and it's gone green and slimy and you throw it out, that is the equivalent of importing a bathtub full of water and pouring it away, importing it from a drought prone country. And when you look, this is data from Tim Hess at Cranfield, on a UK basis, so this is, this is us, we use about two tonnes of rainwater on a day, daily basis to produce food. We use 159 litres of blue water to produce the food that we eat, of which 108 litres is imported. And eight out of the top ten countries that we import food from are already drought prone and increasingly drought prone. So when you start thinking about our global food system and where the food is produced or where it's uh, shipped around and so on, and overlay that issue of the climate becoming more variable, then you can see some of the issues around the fragility of the food system. And of course, the food system, as well as being related to water, is related to energy. Um, I've just seen a tweet that's coming out of the Eat Forum in Stockholm, which is on this week. Um, where Michael Pollan, who's a food commentator from the US, has commented that a single calorie of food produced in our industrial farming system takes 10 calories of fossil fuel to produce the way our system is currently. And so, not surprising that there is a quite clear relationship between the price of food and the price of fuel. And again, as we move into a slightly different world with uh, uncertain energy requirements and our ability to supply it, there is a whole lot of interesting stuff in that space. So, as Paul said, my job on a daily basis is, is to work across government to think about the challenges associated with food. And this is our systems diagram, effectively about food, but you could draw similar systems diagrams about water or other things. We produce food, it impacts on the social, the biophysical, and the atmosphere. The food then goes into some sort of supply chain, it ends up in a supermarket. We end up choosing it, and it impacts our nutrition, health, and well being, but our well being is also impacted from the environments. This is a systemic view, and we also have waste up there. And the question that I ask on a daily basis is how do we make this system work in a sustainable way? How do we make it work? You know, the rhetoric of the last decade has been, oh look, there are some starving people in the world, let's press this button. And actually, by pressing that button, what we have largely done is contributed to obesity on a global basis and produced a hell of a lot of waste. And it's not clear, from a kind of systemic perspective, how we're going to feed the world in a way that is nutritional, in a way that is healthy, therefore, and in a way that keeps us below the two degree Paris Agreement. I think I'll skip. This is just a, about how our food moves around the world. So,
So our global food system is huge. We import, oh no, I will go back. We move food around the world, and one of the issues with our global, global food system is that everybody's diet has become more or less the same in the world. Wherever you go, people eat more or less the same thing. And now, two-thirds of the world's food comes from three crops. Uh, nearly 90% comes from eight crops, one of which is soya. And just to illustrate this, this is the global soy trade, um, that our food system is, is uh, hugely... Um, dependent on moving stuff around on a global basis, and therefore what is available to us depends on a whole lot of things that go on around the world. But soy, we import a hell of a lot of soy into Europe, we feed it to livestock, and then some of those livestock we then export to China or to uh, Russia or places like that. And when we think about the interrelationships between food, water and energy, one of the points that I really want to make today is that there is a framing question. If we're thinking about our food system, then it's a global boundary. If we're thinking about our agricultural system, then that's a very different sort of set of questions um, and set of solutions. Yeah, but I'll come back to that in a little while. Clearly, energy and water um, systems are much more geographically constrained. But then if you think about the embedded water and the embedded energy in the food, and you really want to take a systemic view of our energy use, then it is it is very big. And again, at this this seminar on food waste yesterday in Parliament, you know, although we can say our greenhouse gas emissions from waste is a certain amount in the UK, most of those emissions are to do with growing bananas in Latin America and the production or the growing of the soy that we import to feed our cows. So the emissions that uh, come from our production of beef on a UK farm are largely, not entirely, but largely determined from things which are outside the kind of UK environment. But you can't necessarily say that for our kind of blue and green waters. <coughs> Before I get on to the, to, to the next slide, just pose, ask the question about what does sustainable mean? And the reason I ask this is that increasingly sustainability means whatever people want it to mean, and in different contexts it can mean a whole lot of things. And when I talk to government economists, sustainability is often implicitly meant as sustaining economic growth not sustainability in terms of sustaining the environment in any way that is similar to where it is today. Um, actually, I had an argument with the um, chief economist at USDA a couple of months ago who was saying, um, we can't afford any hits on the economy now. I would rather take two degrees of climate change at the end of the century to avoid a recession now. And that's the kind of thinking around how do we manage um, to forever grow the economy and always put off the environmental cost till later on. And he said, well, you know, end of the century, some people come up with some technical solutions so we don't have to worry about it. And um, there's an interesting Singaporean government document which is about how they imagine in Singapore life in the future. And life in future, because Singapore is so constrained by space, they imagine living underground, effectively. And when I talked to one of the politicians there, I said, you know, what about the extinction of experience? And this chap looked at me and said, who cares? And I said, well, you know, where, where all the forests will be gone, there won't be birds and things like that. And he said, no, you'll go, you'll go, go home, go, go downstairs, and you'll put on your headset, and you'll enter a virtual reality forest. And you won't know the difference between virtual reality and reality. You won't have experienced reality, so it'll be YouTube. But the best thing is that you end up being eaten by bugs, so that you can experience the joy of living in a forest without actually experiencing the downsides. And for some people, that is a compelling vision of the future. Not for me. But I think, you know, this is part of the, the issues, that if we don't sort out the sustainable management of the nexus, then we are going to end up trading off against those sorts of decisions 
from an economic perspective. And so for me, this is you know, about as real as you can get. So anyway, Brundtland, in her report in 1987, crystallized the thinking about sustainability around sustaining development, the needs of today, trading off, not trading off against the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And in her report, she's very certain that the needs of the present are defined by the poorest people in the world. But that meaning has been transmuted, especially by some of our treasury people, to thinking about the needs of today are whatever people demand today, whatever people want. <coughs> so if this is my need, because I want it, then how do we meet my need today? Rather than say, actually, don't be stupid, you're just going to get sick, you're going to create a crisis on the health service, you're going to create an environmental crisis, and so on. So, so I would just throw up that thinking about what sustainability actually means and how to measure it is uh, an interesting area. Now, there are two bits about Nexus that I'm going to talk through briefly over the next few minutes. One is what um, I tend to call the rural Nexus, and I mean non-urban, and the other one is the urban Nexus. And the rural Nexus, you can apply it to land, as I'm going to do here, but you can also apply it to marine ecosystems and you know, other ecosystems and so on that are, uh, provide a range of ecosystem services. So what does land do? It provides food, it provides water, flood defences, home for supporting biodiversity, recreation amenity, etc. has important cultural value, home to culturally important biodiversity, this is a skylark, um, creates energy, stores carbon, etc. etc. So my definition of sustainability, which is a kind of pragmatic one, is the nexus one. How do we manage our land so that, yes, it provides food, but it also provides the whole range of other ecosystem services that we require? And for me, this is the challenge. This is the real challenge of the, the rural nexus, is how do we make this work? Because governments tend to think about only pushing this button or only pushing that button and um, I was at a meeting recently in Brussels, and the head of the FAO, when he was asked what did he think was the biggest risk for food security on a global basis, he said it was the fact that you had a Minister of Environment over there, and a Minister of Farming over there, and a Minister of Climate there, and a Minister of Health there, and they didn't talk to each other. And that's exactly true for us in universities, because we often have the issue that I battle sometimes with colleagues who are molecular biologists who say the answer is just you know, tweaking the genes and growing as much as possible, sustainable intensification, where actually it's the intensification that matters to them. And some of my ecological colleagues say, no, 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 we mustn't grow very much food. Let people starve. We've got to protect the biodiversity. And everybody has a different view. And water people obviously say, oh, no, no, water takes primacy. So the issue for me really is how do we manage all of these together? And I just want to kind of... <coughs> float one of my pet ideas, because I think we don't do enough of it, and I have been surprised how little, in my four or five years working with the Research Council, little proposals have come through to think about how to manage the land as a dynamic system. And to illustrate this, this is harks back, sorry, this harks back to some of my earlier work. We effectively did, a, in a revenue study, we did a, a, a lot of measurements and field work and then did some modeling, and we said, would an environment, would a landscape that produced across the landscape both biodiversity and food, organic land, would that produce in aggregate more or less goods than a landscape that had parcels producing food, so they were intensively managed, and parcels producing biodiversity so that they were kind of mini nature reserves, like the environment schemes, or however you want to do it. And when we did the modeling, it, it kind of shocked me, because I <coughs> always thought the answer was all right. We, we found that by smart land use, and land sparing, land sharing type arguments, you could get more food and more biodiversity out of a mixed landscape that had conventional farming and nature reserves. And that's quite an interesting thing. And the reason, the thing to think about, and the reason I think about landscapes, as per my last slide, 
is that in a sense that's the scale at which we as humans interact with land. We don't expect a field to produce all of the things that we want out of the landscape. Part of what we as humans want is the heterogeneity that comes with different bits of land use, different things being in different places, and if you go on a walk you see different things at different points on your walk and so on. And so if we can make the landscapes in a kind of Henry Ford way be maximally efficient in terms of saying this bit does this function and this bit does this function, how much can we gain in terms of the functionality of the landscape? How much more can we get out of it? Rather than thinking about sustainable intensification and sustainable agriculture and everything about only at the level of the field, how much can we, as one of my PhD students calls it, um, geo, um, geographic, ge, ge, geographic um, engineering, effectively saying, how do we have a smart land use strategy that maximizes what you can get out of each part of your land? And so, since, since that work back in 2010, I've spent quite a lot of time raising funding to do remote sensing and landscape simulations and so on, to see if we can find a way of being able to map landscapes and their ecosystem services, and then effectively look across the landscape and find where areas can do a certain thing, and where areas can do another certain thing, and try and find ways of growing the food where you can grow the food at low cost, and growing the biodiversity, where if you were to grow food, you would have a very high cost, and that kind of smart landscape stuff. And our kind of end game for this is to think about having a landscape simulator so you can go out, out to a farmer and say, well, if you're going to amalgamate these two fields, get rid of this hedgerow, then you will gain this amount of yield, but you'll lose this amount of environmental goods and services. Conversely, if you say to a land manager, actually, if you put a strip here, and that strip should be of this kind of characteristic, and then it will connect the landscape up, then you won't lose very much yield, but you'll gain a hell of a lot of environmental services. And I think there's lots of nexus, interesting nexus stuff around this smart land management, whether at a local scale or a global scale. Then, the next thing that I want to move on from is instead of the challenges of smart landscape, to think about the challenges of demand and the urban. And so coming back to this, I think over the last five years, my, my view has completely changed around. When I started doing my government job, I kind of thought to myself that if somebody said to me, demand is growing, then we had to find a way to supply that. And I think that's, in a sense, it's a bankrupt ar argument for, for many reasons. But it's a bankrupt argument because if the demand is growing and you find a way of fulfilling it, then that won't stop the demand growing. And so you'll have to find a way of fulfilling ever more and ever more. And because of the primacy of economics in the way that we do things, if the demand is creating a pull, we will always end up trading off the things that aren't marketable and therefore ecosystem services because those are largely externalized, the cost of the ecosystem services are largely externalized <coughs> to the market. And I think especially from a food perspective, we are now recognizing, well there was that report from Karina Hawks and Lawrence Haddad that was in the news yesterday, over a third of the world's population is malnourished and that's not because they're starving, that is largely because they're overweight, obese, and the risk of diabetes and non-communicable diseases. So, just as a kind of factoid, this is one of my favorite back of the envelope calculations, a third of the world's food is lost or wasted. So, we throw it away because it's so cheap, or it's lost in fields, we plow it back in because it's not up to grade, according to our specifications or supermarket specifications. A third of the world's food is lost or wasted. A third of the world's calories grown are fed to livestock, which is terribly inefficient in a kind of energetic perspective. And a third of the world's population overeats by about 20% calories per day. If you put all of those loss factors together, then only 41% of the world's calories coming from agriculture are actually used to feed people nutritiously. Now, whether that's 40% or 50% doesn't really matter. There is a hell of a lot 
of scope for adjusting the demand side and freeing up land that would allow us to farm in a different way, more sustainably perhaps, or freeing up land and being able to grow biofuels, because if we want to jet around in the future, we need biofuels. Or freeing up land <coughs> and then using the extra land for carbon capture and storage and that would help bringing us, bringing us back down um, to the Paris climate agreement. So I think thinking about not just the supply side and how do we make the supply side optimized and efficient, but also thinking about the demand side and how do we make the demand side work is, for me, part of the really interesting area. And of course, demand is largely urban. Um, that, now, when you think about the urban nexus, then there is an awful lot of work that's going around on around the world, and this is very much a kind of engineering efficiency-led type stuff. How do you make our systems in, in cities as efficient as possible, um, including local production systems, and so on? But, so yeah, we can clearly do a lot more about making cities efficient, and as the world becomes increasingly urbanized, we have to do that. I'm not saying we don't have to do that. Um, whether it is in the home or smart fridges and all the rest of that. Um, it is quite interesting. So one of the comments that somebody made at the meeting yesterday is that, you know, although we're getting smarter fridges, we are also getting bigger fridges. And in the old days, when you had a small fridge, you didn't store very much in there. So you were actually probably more efficient at using it because you knew what was in there at any time and it had to be used up or it would go off. The bigger the fridges become, the more they are waste generators rather than food generators. And I haven't kind of thought about that. But clearly smart fridges can help in terms of thinking about storing food and telling you when to eat it and ordering it for you, etc. etc. And I have a fridge, so this is a personal anecdote, sorry. I have a fridge which is so fucking unsmart, it is just stupid. Because so it's five years old. After two years, the internal light bulb went. And I downloaded the PDF because I couldn't work out how to get the plastic cover off. And it says in the, in, the, in the PDF of the owner's manual, it says, to change the light bulb, you have to call an engineer. This is not something you can do at home. So I have lived with a dark fridge for the last three years. And that means I can't see what's in there. But I'm not going to pay £200 to change, change a 20 p light bulb. But that's just an example of how silly our design systems are because the person who designed that wasn't thinking about the efficiency of the whole, was perhaps thinking about the energy efficiency of the light bulb, but not the efficiency of the whole. But <clears throat> what I want to emphasize is that efficiency is, in a sense, a double edged sword. And I refer here to this chap who's a Victorian economist. Um, who pointed out, it's called the Japanese paradox, he said, if you make coal-fired power stations, I was trip up coal-fired power stations, if you make them more efficient, you would expect to use less coal. And what actually happened, of course, is you made it more efficient, you made energy cheaper, so you used more coal. And I think the, the drive in urban nexus thinking in terms of increasing efficiency often stimulates demand rather than decreases demand. And I, you know, in a sense, the food system is a, is a big Jevons paradox that no matter how much we produce cheap food, it's freely available. No matter how much we graze on it and it makes us ill with some statistics, etc., we end up still wanting ever more of it. And um, as, I, as I said earlier, um, there's now more people since 2004 for women, 2010 for men, more people on a global basis who are obese than are underweight. Less than 50% of the world's population is of normal weight now. And when you think about our UK food system, we have 10 billion pounds worth of economy, which is farming. The direct cost of nitrogen and phosphate pollution is about 5 billion pounds. The greenhouse gas emissions will probably be the same order of magnitude. And the ill health that comes from um, poor diet is somewhere in the region of 50 billion pounds. So the costs of our system are 60 billion pounds, and it creates 10 billion pounds for the production economy. 
So why the hell does DEFRA only think about NFU and not think about the system as a whole? When you start thinking about the system as a whole, then actually getting people to eat less, eat better, does a whole lot of, uh, of goods for the system as a whole. And it's not just about the radicals of lecturing people and food taxes and so on and so on and so on. A lot of what we need to do in the urban environment to change habits is to change the environment itself. So, you know, if you are in an inner city housing estate and you don't have a car and you have to walk to a shop, what are you going to find in your local corner shop? It's going to be pot noodles or you're going to walk past a fried chicken place or something like that. You know, if you go, if you're poor and you're on a budget, if you get sold two things of coke, then that looks like a bargain, even if at the end of the day you don't either need the sugar or you end up throwing out half a bottle because it's gone flat. Um, my wife went to a national tennis competition recently with food for children for 14 year olds, and at the sports centre in Leeds, the hot food for the national children's tennis competition was fried sausages, fried fish, and three different types of chips. Now, no matter how much knowledge you have about a good diet, if you're in that sort of food environment, there is no way that you can have a good diet. So the demand side is not just about creating energy or telling, uh, creating efficiency or telling people what to do. It is also about fundamental changes to um, the structure of the system as well as all the other things. Right, I seem to have, as usual, I, I'll just wrap it on and on and on, so forgive me. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words about systems thinking. Um, I, by background, I'm, I'm a modeler, and so I tend to think about describing systems in model, <coughs> models. And I think it is very difficult in some sense to come up with some degree of nexus projects that doesn't have some ability to analyze the complexities of interactions. And Part of the reason I, I think like this is that um, a colleague of mine is a professor of systems biology at Imperial, and he did an experiment with a whole bunch of PhD students in his departments, that he gave them a simple diagram like this, where there are three interacting entities, some of which were positive and some of which were negative, and he said, well, if you increase node zero by, no, if you increase node two by 20%, what would be the impact on node one? And even though all of the PhDs and postdocs in his department and some of the professors were professors of systems biology, it was no better than random in terms of trying to interpret whether or not an interaction, uh, uh, pushing this button here would lead to a positive or negative outcome. So I think when you start working with very complex interacting systems, the modeling is very useful in terms of being able to articulate, if you do this, then this will come out rather uh, than avoiding guesswork. But clearly, you can't model a system without understanding the parts, so you need modelers and a whole range of other things. Um, and I think also for my policy stuff, decision makers are often willing to believe a quantitative model where they're not willing to believe a qualitative model. And so actually I think it helps not so much as decision support, but as I say here, discussion support. Um, yeah, not all models are useful. This is the Bangkok urban system. You know, that's very difficult to explain that to anybody. Um, okay, just a couple of words to, to end on about some of the issues that I think I have learned in my career as a nexologist or a systems person. So the first thing is that setting the framing, setting the boundary is crucial. So I'll just give you a very simple illustrative example. If you ask a BBSRC funded researcher what is the answer to the nexus, they will say grow more with fewer inputs. If you ask a food systems person about what is the solution to the, to the nexus, then they will say change people's demand. And so both of those are internally consistent, but the BBSRC person will be thinking about the production side and the food systems person will be thinking about the, the entirety. And that's part of the issue to do with the way that we talk across each other, that we can all, all be right, or we're right for the wrong set of reasons, in a sense, that we're all 
saying, giving an answer to a different question, and we don't necessarily recognize that the other person has framed the question in a different way. Um, I think when you have a graphical or a, a model, well, a qualitative or quantitative model, that actually doing experiments with it allows you to identify where the points of intervention should be in a way that is coherent. So I come from a background in ecology, and elasticity, and sensitivity analysis, and effectively what you do is you play with the models and you find in a case like this that actually if you press that then you get more waste, which is fallen off the diagram. Um, and actually if you change demand, especially if you change demand for meat, then the whole, the whole world looks an incredibly different place. And so you identify leverage points is important. Um, yeah, all models are clearly wrong. Um, yeah, dribble, dribble. Okay, I've got a set of conclusion slides. Um, this is kind of trivial, um, all of these things I've, I've said. Um, the, yeah, the thing I've just skipped over very quickly was I, th I think increasingly we want to find ways of looking to the future, the kind of scenario that Horizon's getting the foresight team and then working through the consequences of business as usual decisions to impact upon the future, find out that they don't work very well, and then find a future that we want, and then backcast to what we should be doing now. So one of the issues that is true across the whole nexus is that we are incredibly locked into business as usual thinking. You talk to industry policymakers, and they say, well, we can only make in incremental changes. And if we only make in incremental changes, then almost certainly we will not reach Paris, we will not have sustainability, we will not live in a world that we want to live in. So part of the art, I think, of Nexus thinking is to say, if we want to live like this, what will be the consequences and what will we have to do, and then find the leverage point to move the system along the way, and at least discuss it. Because one of the things about the changing world is that policy, is often made at a time of crisis. And almost certainly over the next 10 years, there will be a time of crisis which will be driven by Brexit or President Trump or the breakup of the European Union or ISIS exploding in the Middle East or some big climate change impact in terms of severe weather systems, the next El Nino or something like that. There will be some event where if we want the system to move in a different direction, we should be ready with a whole set of policies to push it in that direction. And too often academia has been reactive, I think, to our business as usual way of doing things and not thinking about how we make business unusual work rather than business as usual. And actually, there's quite a lot of thinking in industry about how to do that, much more so than perhaps than in government, but we in academia often fall a little bit behind that. So, some very simple conclusions. Our fixed supply chain is, in, is likely to be increasingly at risk because of the reasons I've just been talking about. So how can we think about the future and how can we make it work? Food is inherently nexus, <coughs> so therefore we have to do what we're doing in the room, getting everybody together and thinking about that, which requires integrated thinking at multiple spatial scales, it requires developing relationships of trust, it requires <coughs> some time and resources internally to start getting a common view with other people. And I think we often underestimate how difficult it is to become an interdisciplinary scientist, because it does take time, and too often we want a very quick gain as academics. Where's my nature paper going to come from? And if it doesn't come in six months, then we give up on the idea. But actually, if we want to live in an equitable world for our children and grandchildren, I would say investing some of this time and trying to align your career to answering some of the global challenges is important. Um, I think part of the challenge for Nexus, especially in the rural environment, is that every place needs to be managed in a different way. So there is not a one-size-fits-all answer. So there is a, uh, issues there to do with how do you understand what to do in any one place and the context dependence of it. And science has historically been about creating general answers from specifics, but increasingly I think we want to take general theory and apply it to specifics and kind of reverse that and find a way of actually being able to predict what you should do 
to manage your nexus in any, any given place. Fourth conclusion is about demand and supply. I would say increasingly, me as an uh, effectively sustainable agricultural person from background, there's no point in me thinking about how to sustain agriculture without how to, thinking about how to sustain demand. There's no point in me thinking about how to sustain agriculture without thinking about climate change and resilience and adaptation and so on. So all of these nexus things come together. Um, part of the issue I think about change of demand is that we should be better at articulating to people, public, publics, so policy makers as well, what is the value of the environment, what is the value of the food, what is the value of the resources that go into it. Um, in the long run, externalizing the costs of food and water production is just not tenable if it's going to be sustainable. Somehow we've got to find a way of internalizing those costs. So people, when you buy a carrot, you're buying the water that's gone into the carrot, you're buying its impacts on climate, you're buying its impacts on water, uh, on soils, and so on. You're paying more for it, you respect it more, and you're less, less willing to waste it. <coughs> so, thank you. Sorry, that was a little bit of a track chat. Okay. Yeah, canter through, a couple of minutes over time. But I hope I've thrown out some thoughts about thinking about why Nexus thinking is important and some of the challenges as I see it from my rather food lens perspective. Thanks very much. I think we've got time for some questions and comments before we have a quick break. Or not, as the case may be. No, sure. I'll, I'll go there. Go on, somebody can say you're talking bullshit then. Always what happens. Uh, so you mentioned the relationship between academia and policy makers, let's say, and in some respects, in terms of the climate challenges, as well as the food, energy, water nexus, it's quite dysfunctional. Absolutely. So we've been told to develop scenarios of 1.5 degrees, and the only way we can do that is basically magic up carbon capture storage by the middle of this century, which allows policy makers to continue to claim that we can stay within 1.5 or 2, or maybe even 3 or 4. So the same kind of dynamics will apply, I would have thought, to the nexus that you've just described. We must assume there'll be some magic box, sometimes we call it sustainable intensification, that will increase food, reduce impacts, you know, free trips to the moon for the over 50s or something. That's Richard Branson. Yeah, so, so at what point do we need, as an academic community, to be more engaged and pushing back and trying to promote some of what you call that business as unusual policy formulation? All the time. All the time. Um, so, I chaired an event in Westminster a few weeks ago and the panel of MPs, and somebody from the floor was talking about what it was and said, it's your job to make the difficult decisions. And the politicians, all of them, and there's one from each party, they all said, they looked at each other and said, no, it's not our job to make difficult decisions. It is our job to enact difficult decisions when you want them. And I think, for me, part of the issue here is that we don't have enough public discourse about the costs and benefits of our ways of doing things. And it's only once it becomes politically expedient for politicians to engage in something will they engage in it. So that's about making things, in a sense, talked about popular, talked about discussed, raise the profile and so on and we as academics we have always been very bad at doing that because if it's controversial we tend to kind of hunker down and try and avoid it but I think we have a role in terms of saying you know like I was trying to do with the climate you talk to people about climate change and they say so what and nobody is standing up and saying well the consequences of us doing this are that you know the world might only support seven billion people at the end of the century if all sorts of crazy things happen and, and so, you know, I think a part of our role all the time is to try and hold up some sort of standard to the discourse around what people's expectations are. And there's nothing wrong with nets, there's nothing wrong with carbon capture and storage, other than we don't have a way of doing it yet, other than forests. So if we're going to have forests, where's the land going to come from? And how's that going to affect our food? And, you know, you're straight back into another nets question. And so, you know, there is an awful lot for us to engage with. 
and industry too. You know, in industry, there is a lot of industry thinking about where the challenges are into the future and getting people. I know I'm terribly oversubscribed in my budget, in my time budget, and I uh, I have to turn down five or six things for everything that I can in, I get invited to. And people say, well, who else can come and put together this kind of big picture? And I have a kind of list of about 20 academics around Europe who can speak languages that people can listen to in, in different situations. And we don't train people enough to do that kind of externally facing, representing science as a whole rather than representing your discipline. And I know there's one university in this room which is um, sitting at the front bench here. Well, every time I go, they have plant scientists and have a conversation with their plant scientists. They get their individual plant scientists to talk to me, each one to talk to me, because not one of them has the confidence to talk about what their neighbours are doing and represent the area as a whole, because they each have their particular genes or pathways or whatever they're doing. And it's really quite illustrative, you know, with my talk to myself around the country, how very often people do not understand the consequences of what they're doing relative to the person next door or relative to the department across the street. And part of the sense, I think, of having a nexus group like this is not that you're magically going to all work together and create a big grant that someone's going to give you 50 million pounds to do, but by pulling people together and talking, then you start sharing similar framings, and then that becomes possible for you to understand everybody else's, and then you can do this kind of talking to a wider group, not about your own research, but about the issues in town. So I think, you know, universities need to do things in quite a different way, and we don't get kind of positive. Thank you. Okay.